Greetings in the name of the Most High, and once again, <clears throat> ah, here we are. And uh, yeah, I promised in all uh, in all gang stalking review and extravaganza, um, and I keep wanting to uh, explain some of the weird stuff. Like I remember when I was. Um, 17 driving down Sunset Boulevard and uh, yeah that one the famous one in the middle of the night like 3 in the morning and having people out on their driveways uh, waiting for me to drive down the street to show me that they were there staring at me I know that sounds I've waited a long time to say that I've waited a long time to say that Mainly because, mainly because of the fact that um, ah, it's active dogs. Uh, it's uh, an extreme paranoid statement that people are on their driveways waiting for you to drive by to scare you or show you that they're there knowing you're going to be driving by and come out on their driveway just at that moment on Sunset Boulevard at 3 a.m., to watch you drive by and point at you as you go and laugh and mock and, and do a kind of an insane level of street theater and have it be on that level. Giving you, of course, the idea that it's everybody, it's everyone, it's cosmic, it's completely against you, it's completely surrounding you. How many of you had, had a weird experience like that? Well, this was fairly commonplace. I mean, it gets even more bizarre, but I wanted to take the gang stalking to the next level because, you know, these the same things happen, you know, the delivery van and, uh, you know, tailing, following, uh, breaking into your house or your apartment when you're not there, uh, rearranging things, taking things out, putting them back differently. You know, all that that's been established as fact and that paranoia uh, given is going on while this other thing, and then it get, takes an even more exotic turn. I see, uh, you know, perhaps it, it, almost like a hallucination, another set of houses that are there, and this is later on, this is more recent in another neighborhood of Los Angeles. I see another set of houses that aren't there and another set of people that shouldn't be there. And uh, it ends up completely changing the situation. Um, you know, and I see them, for example, going to a, and this is late night, all black tie at some party. And I'm looking through the binoculars at another house that's not the house that's there. And they all come to the window in black tie. Again, this is like late night, 2 or 3 a.m. When I'm looking through the binoculars, which they couldn't possibly see me in the darkness, and then having to see through binoculars into a house, into a picture window, and there was a stairwell and a chandelier, and then this picture window at the bottom of the, of the stairs. And they all came rushing in their tuxedos and... Uh, black gowns to the window and to wave at me with the binoculars. And then I put the binoculars down, and then put them back up again real quickly. And then, then they started waving again right on cue as if they could see when I took the binoculars down and when I put them back up. Then the next day, again, it's cosmic, it's everywhere. You're a fool to even think you can fight this. You know, the, the, that's the, the message, right? The next day, there is no house, a two-story house, white house with, um, you know, picture window and, um, you know, stairwell and stairway and, you know, pretty elegant. There is nothing like that there. There is no picture window. There's just some trees and the the back of a distant house. The windows would be facing the other way out toward the view anyway. 
Now, I'm willing to say that's a hallucination of someone that's been driven batty. Meanwhile, the, um, the breaking in, the, um, all of that weirdness is going on at the same time as I'm seeing into this other world. And then later I saw it again in the form of a party. There were actually police helicopters flying over it. This was another property up on the hill. And um, there were all kinds of people there and kids there and looked like it was like a swimming party. When I'm looking at it through kind of a, like a telescope thing because I, I have to, you know, I mean, that's the only way I can see. But then I noticed that several of the people that are there turn their attention to me. Put the scope away. You can't see anything, you know, but it's almost like they're looking. They see that I have a lens and they're looking right at it. Almost like that entire, you know, and again, the next day, there is no place like that. There was no party going on there. There was no pool there for their, um, there may have been a police helicopter, but there was nothing like that. And then <clears throat> further to this, there was a, uh, you know, a 50 foot tall kind of mask hanging in the air of a clown you know, of a kind of a Harlequin type clown face, you know, if I can make black and white with cakey makeup, black lips, black, you know, sitting there kind of smiling over the whole event. And I know now it's really sounding psychedelic. And then again, not there later. So I came to know over the years that what I had seen there which was all coordinated every time I pick up the glass there, they were looking at me and, you know, mocking, waving, you know, like you're being watched from all angles and from all dimensions. The next day, nothing there. Well, after a while of understanding this phenomenon, you know, understanding that how powerful the enemy is in producing, say it's a hallucination. Okay. Because what gives it, Credibility is a hallucination, but an engineered one, understand? In other words, one timed, created, etc., to freak me out personally and to have the event that I'm looking at turn on me. Like the people there become cognizant of me and then start <clears throat> waving and laughing and pointing and, and, you know, all that kind of negative mocking stuff. And so it gives you an idea of just how powerful the enemy is. Now, granted, I do believe that there is, in our other dimensions, where they're, sure, they're manipulatable, but when it has to do with your experience, in other words, what I observed directly had to do with me and not of itself, which would have been a paranoid statement that would get you in you know, trouble <clears throat> because um, you know, the society doesn't want you to see through the facade having seen through it, you realize it is a dimension and it is targeted against you and you were meant to go look with binoculars or however you're going to see it or directly or whatever. You were meant to look at it and then at that moment it was going to look at you or the people on those driveway steps who were there timed to your driving by, you were meant to see that whether it's real or imagined, the enemy can create powerful hallucinations. And what was, what was at stake at that time? Now we're spanning about a 35 year window between the, these two events, but what connects them and what was the going on at the time? Well, at the time, um, Satan through his people or through neighbors and through friends, uh, said that that's it. You either join us or it's going to be holy hell will be unleashed and one attack after another. And let's just take these as attacks. Sure, I've seen people freaked out in the street yelling and pointing and they haul the people off to the mental hospital. I've seen that too. That happens to people. Later I found out that behind these hallucinations, I asked someone, I said, well, this is what I saw. Pretty freaky, huh? And he goes, he goes, it was real. I was there. You know, 
You, do you have any idea what you're up against? And this was a friend who was also a traitor, but a trusted friend at the time, but part of this whole panoply of attacks and of gang stalking, surveillance, infiltration, um, tailing, you know, and so forth and so on. And, you know, he was there, I guess, appointed by them to say, if you want this to stop, just say the word and we can make all that go away. Then at some, one point, I'm like, he got really bold and he was like, well, we can do this to you and we can do that to you. And then I realized I'm speaking with my enemy. Now I'm still friends with this person, but, you know, obviously he was then possessed by a demon. Is this getting really <laughs> sounding crazy? See, that, that's why no one talks about it, because it just sounds so crazy. You know, it just sounds so paranoid, so nuts, so psychotic. But you see, those are the tools that the enemy uses, the, you know, that, that, that the enemy can create very powerful scenarios that are real to everybody in the room. Remember, uh, you know what I mean? And that, that, that it would be counted as real coming from another dimension because we are all tracked, all of us on earth, all humans, all souls, 24-7. Even if Satan owns you, you're still tracked uh, to make sure you're loyal, Right? Nobody gets away, and then, or else this kind of hell is unleashed. So for a while, I got into it. You know, I started like, you know, trying to see it everywhere, and I would, uh, when it looked like, you know, people were tailing me, I would just get out of the car and wave at them. You know, I kind of got into that bold sort of thing of embracing it and enjoying it, and I would start praying in Jesus' name to rebuke it later on, and I would bind it and rebuke it and cast it out and then I found out it was in the church and that they started in on the same kind of things and the same hor horrific supernatural things started happening and then they warned me and they said if you want a sheen like we have and they didn't say sheen but like indicating power but they had a like a halo kind of glow over them right at certain points like it I, I liken this to right after doing a ritual whatever ritual it is they do that they had that sheen and it would wear off over, say, the course of a day, then they'd have to go do it again. They'd have to go back jack and do it again. <laughs> or whatever ritual it is. You know, it doesn't really matter. But, I mean, so they'd have to keep feeding like vampires to keep that sheen alive. And this was the pastor, the elder, the deacon guy. You know, it was uh, the, the head of a very large church. They all had this sheen and they were all in on it. And they would warn me. You say, you know, Zeph, we're all the same. You can't fight us. We don't allow anyone here at this church who will not conform, i.e. bow your knee down to Satan. And I wondered, well, how come you're teaching from the Bible and having ministry training and Bible training so that people can go out and become ministers? What would you have to say to me if I met you on the street about Jesus, that Jesus is really fake, it's, we're really just recruiting so that we can get our hive mind conformity going and do our little rituals and really have this sort of exterior control mechanism called religion that we put on you to keep you on the same page with us. But really the bottom line at the end of the day, it's behind closed doors and the same raging pedophilia and murders, uh, rituals and all this stuff is going on in the background. And all this stuff is approved of and covered up for and protected. And you want me to join that so that you will stop harassing me? Is that, is it really that bad? In other words, Rosemary's baby on steroids? You fly to some other part of the world, they say we've been expecting you. It's Hotel California everywhere you turn around. And they laugh and go, tisk, tisk, tisk. You know, just submit. And it will all end. The whole globe, the whole world, the whole cosmos, everything, even the animals can be turned against you and can watch you and track you. And extraordinarily bad luck kind of things that nobody, the odds would be a billion, trillion, quadrillion to one against will happen to you and to you only in the sight of men. And they will laugh and go, oh, like Job's friends, you must really not be pleasing the Lord for this kind of unluckiness to happen to you. 
And then they bring the Lord into it as another lever, another mechanism of conformianity, which is a play on the word churchianity, right? Which, of course, church we know is, means fake. <coughs> Until I see a church boldly state what I just stated, I will consider them to be fake. Because what, what other point of ministry is there other than to minister to you about things like this so that you'll feel comforted, so that people will have strength to stand against the enemy? Yes, and prayer knocked it back, didn't it? So I relied on prayer over the years to get by. It doesn't mean that I'm not knocked down, drag out, and or silence for a month like what just happened. It doesn't mean that, no, I can't do a show with a schedule, even the once a week show becomes difficult because of all this stuff that goes on in the warfare. And as a person, you know, um, who, you know, travels and whatnot, or my attitude here even at the homestead is I still have like a feeling like a gypsy, like I've, you know, any moment I'm up and I have to leave or I go here, I go there, it doesn't matter, but there's never a schedule because I can't stick to a schedule. There's never a plan because I can't stick to a plan because every time there's a plan, it gets thwarted. You know, if there's a plan that there'll be a show every week, then, you know, there's going to be all these forces against it. And um, it, it goes on with almost everything, everything in life, every single thing, even every single thing, except, of course, if you want to do anything self-destructive, you know, you'll be aided and embedded with that. There'll be no one there to stop that from happening. And so there's this constant force, you know, destroying everything and every intention and every plan at every turn. And this is 24-7 and this never lets up. When you see me talking here, it's because I've pushed against it and gotten myself a little bubble, but it will be, you know, shortly after this podcast, it will be back to business as usual. And so, you know, people that would make the good fight today would be considered, of course, you know, basically bums because you couldn't, there's really almost no way to survive in the workplace there's no way to survive among family and friends. There's no way to, you know, it's, you've, all you've got is prayer. All you've got is the Lord. Because the whole world has now doubled down on the sat satanic, doubled down on the gang stalking, doubled down on the, on, on the stuff that worked before. In other words, when they mess with you, or they mess with me, they then get a boost on their side. So because the economy has gone south, and just mainly because of that, and jobs have gone south, they're going ahead and doing more of what they did before to you in order to keep their jobs. To keep, see what I mean? To, in other words, it's going to take a lot more of that kind of stuff hurting other people, hurting innocent people, hurting people that meant them no harm in order for them to keep their grubby, filthy little jobs. So... You know, basically, your children can starve, but theirs are going to be fed and fat, thank you very much, over the demise of you. And that's your good citizen of society. And that's what you're up against, because what I just described is John Q. Public. On every street corner. In every office building. Everywhere. And they're so smug in their death. They don't even realize they're dead. They don't even realize that they have hit the end of the line and that there's nothing else for them to do except quit breathing because there is no afterlife for them. I repeat, there is no afterlife, you know, other than about a billion times the pain and suffering they've inflicted on others will be inflicted upon them. Yeah, that's awaiting. But, and that's all that's waiting them is torture. I mean, they have no idea that what awaits them on the other side of death is absolute horror, absolute pain, ad absolute attack. Everything they doled out will be doled out upon them because they don't have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't have salvation. So they're going into death with basically a curse on their head that states, for everything done since the days of Adam... 
from Cain, from you know, Nimrod and, and all that and beyond, and everything everyone's done in every un- unjust war and every unjust situation will be visited upon your head individually. All the pain and suffering that is due, the bad guys, will be on your individual head, even if you didn't get your hands that dirty. Because God is no respecter of persons. The same judgment that would be meted out to, um, you know, and should be meted out to any human being would be the same level of justice. Any human being who rejects Christ, and that is the way of Christ, you know, the way, not, not this fake Christianity stuff, which is just a way of burying the truth. Uh, anyone that rejects that would have the full measure of the full punishment like Jesus was punished for the sins of the whole world and then was redeemed in life and he, turned, and he overcame death. And that overcoming of death was the redemption for all humanity. Okay, so if you reject that, which you have to do if you're a conform to the satanic or to the world or a worlder, you have to reject that in order to be at the starting point. And then when the gun sounds, you start down the track of harming other people to keep yourself in good stead with Satan. At that point, you're dead and twice dead, and the sentence awaiting you upon death. And don't ever die. Try to live as long as you can, because when you die, you will have everlasting punishment of, and, and be forgotten at the same time. And be, you'll be cut off from God at the same time, and in this punishment will be without God. And it's kind of hard to explain, but it's spoken of in the book of Daniel in the 12th chapter, you know, there'll be some resurrected to everlasting contempt. In other words, there will be a punishment for what you've done. There will be justice. That you don't go off like What Dreams May Come movie and go off into your fantasy or it's a mind game. That, that's the mind. That movie was about the mind, not the spirit. So it had very little to do with reality. It was just basically satanic and hallucinatory and had no bearing upon reality. That's what the Satanists would love as an afterlife consequence. They would love to be able to just fulfill their fantasies and evolve and go into one scenario. Yeah, they would love a future like that after death. But that is not the way it occurs. The way it occurs is there is a judgment awaiting every one of us. There is a punishment awaiting every one of us. And the only escape from that punishment is Jesus Christ because he paid the price for us and substituted sacrifice for us was the Lamb of God, spotless and pure, that redeems the whole world. And without embracing and accepting his gift of salvation, i.e., you know, and that changes a person, of course, because you have receipt of the Holy Spirit, you know, comes to live within you. The Lord lives actually within you and changes you from the inside out. And, you know, so when that happens, oh, you wonder, okay, you got in a situation like that with the gangs and it was that bad where you had actual, you know, just every stop pulled out to get you. What made you hold on, Z? How did you get through that with that kind of hallucination, that kind of torture? That kind of, you know, being tailed and, you know, surrounding you like the whole world, everyone's in on it. Like you're in, you were dropped into some sort of virtual game where, you know what I mean, that it was impossible. How did you keep from going crazy? Jesus is how. Jesus delivered. Jesus made it all right. And then, of course, Jesus taught me not to do certain things that would open up certain doors where that sort of thing would be raging. Because there are doors you can open where that sort of thing, what I just described earlier in the, in the show, where that sort of thing would actually rage. Now, no one's going to tell you this stuff because they don't know. Most people have seen what I've seen went completely stark raving mad and never came back. I mean, i just be honest with you. You're not going to hear it on a podcast. Um, well, it looks like I lost most of what I was going to say. That is 
again, a supernatural thing that couldn't have happened. And I don't know how it happened, but basically it's something like this. I mean, I was talking for the last uh, 45 minutes about gang stalking and about the fact that there were other worlds that you could see into. I guess I must have, I don't know how it got turned off. And I'm not sure why, but what I was talking about was the kind of thing they don't want you to hear. In other words, I explained what reality was, what this virtual game is that we're in. And it's not a theory. It's literally true what I'm saying. You know, the, um, I talked about the incidents. This was all erased. From when I was 18, I was driving down Sunset Boulevard. I, I don't know if this got on the tape or not. And they were all waiting on the outside of their driveway, looking at me and pointing and laughing as I was driving down Sunset at 3 in the morning. What are the odds on that? Okay. And then people at random coming up to you saying, you know, things to indicate that they're in on the game and they're watching you. And there's no place you can go, no place you can run, no place you can hide. And jumping out of the fabric of this game to tell you you're, you're going down or to scare you or whatever. And then if you explain to people about it, they know what you're talking about, but they'll lock you up in the loony bin. And then there, instead of having patients, they have plants there who will work on you further. And, you know... They're under surveillance. The, so when you say gang stalkers, you're dealing with something on a multi-level reality. Anyway, they too are under surveillance 24-7, which is why they try to kill you for no reason. Even if they don't know you, they'll try to sabotage your, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll do it no matter what to boost themselves because, and then of course, you know, it never works out. What goes around comes around and they go down in, you know, horrible, horrible life because... The whole problem is this, this whole thing centers around Jesus. If anyone rejects Christ, which is what you have to do to be one of them, one of the gang stalkers, has to reject Christ, has to be on that side of things. In other words, there is a side that you go on where there's a bunch of people there that you relate to all over the world who are in the same thing you're in. Okay, That's a second death alignment. Well, what ends up happening, of course, is the full measure of punishment for all the crimes of humanity and all the unsolved crimes and all the crimes ever done get visited upon each individual head upon death. So these people will have the most horrible fate when you think about how bad it's going to be for them, how horrible the torture will be, how just absolutely in, in, incomprehensible it will be on each one who dies in this reality without accepting the redemption of the Lamb of God that saves the world. Without that, any one of us would go into eternal punishment. There is no way out. But anyway, back to this thing. I don't know how much got described, but I was talking about the incident. Well, I just have to recreate it. I was talking about the incident where uh, I would look out the window and look across at uh, a... Um, house in the middle of the night and there was a stairway and people in you know a picture window that I could see through with binoculars and a stairwell and people dressed up in black tie and so forth and the minute I was looking they would all flock to the window and start waving at me three in the morning and they couldn't see because I put the glasses down I realized that I was standing in the dark how could they see how could they know I was there and this kind of thing would happen over and over again um I didn't dare describe it to anyone because, you know, that would be a ticket to the loony bin and I didn't want to go back to that. So, you know, like it was when I was a kid, you know, there's been this constant thing. I wrote a lot about this in Lamb. Um, you know, this reality they don't talk about because, right, and while this is going on, that kind of like hallucination mind game, it's impossible what I saw. It's impossible driving down the street and having everyone on their driveway pointing at you and laughing at you at three in the morning. It's impossible. That's the point. So the gang, but any, any victim of gang stalking will tell you that's all going on. But when they try to figure out how they're doing it, they, can't, they don't factor in the supernatural part. The fact that this is a virtual game. The fact that they can mess with anything on the board. The fact that they don't want to be messed with so they don't talk about it. They don't act it. They just behave. They just do what they got to do so they get food on their table. And it really comes down to, if I don't do this, I don't eat. So 
If I talk about this, I get punished. So I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to do what I got to do so I can live my life. Even if it hurts other people, so be it. And that's the, that is the deal they make with the devil. And what that means is second death. Eternally cut off from God. Because the whole center of gang stalking, the whole way I had gotten through it from you know, 15, 16, 17 years old and through this horrible time, it was the, it, literally everywhere you go, there'd be another one popping out saying, we know who you are. And you know that kind of street theater, mind game kind of stuff that makes people go insane. And that's what they were trying to do. You see, what the gang stalking people complain about is on a much bigger level than they could ever, ever fully comprehend. For example, when you go into the workplace and they suddenly all manifest against you at once like they're all of one hive mind, that's not possible. See? In, in reality, the way you think of reality, things like that could not occur. You'd be considered crazy if you talked about it that way. But it did occur. Proving my point that the guys surveilling all of us are behind a little wall that you can't see. This reality is totally mutable. And they're tracking us all. And the goal is the growing and buying and selling of souls and um, putting pressure on those souls that will not conform, that will not give up the salvation, actually just give up and become one of them. And anyone that doesn't conform, they will mess with endlessly, but they do it, not a group of people somewhere, but from behind a veil in another dimension, and they track us all. In other words, this dimension is bogus! Does not exist the way you think it does in your mind. I wish you could have had all the incidents, but now we'll just have to recreate the, the talk because I, I lost, I don't know, 45 minutes or whatever. The point is that when it was cosmic messing with, it becomes cosmic. It's your neighbors, it's your family, your mother and father turn into devils, it's your brothers and sisters, it's your children even manifesting like... Yeah, they've got the sheen now. They went over and now they come to mess with you. And this whole network could not happen if this reality is real. Could not. It could not be orchestrated in such perfect symmetry and geometry. Could not be done. So gang stalking emanates from this supernatural reality and from this premise that the world is a virtual game. It's not real. Okay? Otherwise, they could not coordinate the way they coordinate you would not have such um, epic uh, and horrific scenarios as happened to people who were victims of gang stalking, targeted ind individuals. Could not happen. It's not just the satellites. It's not just the computer. It's not just the guy down the street, you know, you know breaking into your house and moving things around. And it, that's a very small piece of it. It's on a much grander scale, much more mind blowing. And if you don't have your wits about you, meaning Jesus Christ to see you through it. You will flip out. You will go nuts or you will have to, like I see all these TIs forming these groups, these self-help groups, but they forget to pray. You have to understand something. You're not dealing with a scientific reality here. Two plus two equals four. And if I have to say this over and over until the day I die, I will. The gang stalking thing I've been familiar with since I was a little kid. You know, surveillance, being followed, all, all those things that get mentioned. But then it goes much further than that. To the point of seeing things that aren't there. You know, another incident was a party that was going on up on a, on a ridge hill. From, I could see it from where I was, my perspective in my backyard, which overlooked the valley of Los Angeles. And I looked up there with a, you know, with a binoculars or a telescope or something. And again, all these people arriving there, there was a police helicopter or a helicopter sort of hovering over the place. It seemed like thousands of people were there. This is two or three in the morning, like on a weekday. And there was a huge figure of, of like a Harlequin clown face over the whole thing. And I thought, this is insane. You know, this is, I, I can't believe I'm seeing this. And, you know, when I look, then everyone would start pointing back at me, looking at them and waving and laughing. Same kind of thing. So I tell my friend about it. 
The next day he goes, yeah, you, you, what you saw was real. The next day, there is no house like that there. There's nothing there but an empty ridge, no house at all. Just, you know, the top of, say, Mulholland Drive. Yes, I did live there, so <laughs> I was just describing. And, and there was nothing there. He goes, yeah, but that didn't mean you didn't see it. And so I'm like, okay, friend, well, you're, you're a traitor, obviously, infiltrator, hanging around me. What do you know? So I kept trying to pick his brain. And he just wouldn't talk about a lot of stuff. And every once in a while, something would leak out from him. So I kept him around, like trying to figure out what he knew. And he would even see the same things I would see. And then, and then corroborate it. You know, so you had this going on at the same time. People driving by the house at the same time. Parking, you know, across the street. There's a guy with like a microwave thing that is on his roof. That would raise up in the middle of the night, and this was no hallucination. I guess it was like an infrared type of thing. It was like a grid, a rectangular grid that arose on his roof. And he claimed one day he could see me in the house and follow me around through infrared. So I guess that's what it was. So then that's working, and he also had cameras on his roof. And then, you know, you get the idea you're on closed circuit TV in your neighborhood or whatever, and then you realize the vastness of the network goes far beyond natural to supernatural. And I can tell you that this whole thing goes also to human sacrifice and evil of the most unfathomable sort. These people are all connected with that. I mean, if they would go to the extent of having cameras and an infrared thing on the house to surveil people to do this kind of thing and coordinate people coming in and going out of your house and moving things around and then following you on various cameras and linking it all up with computers and having a virtual 24-7 surveillance via camera, just like a, kind of in the movies, where everywhere you go, everything you do is on camera and they're watching. That is exactly right. But you need to widen that to be all people are being watched. Even that guy with that infrared, he's being watched. And so, you know, and then when they throw the street theater 